Yo, what's going on, everybody? This is not the smartest guys in the room. Tom's in the house today. I see Tom. Lovely to see Tom. Uh, I'm going over some topics here that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about views, reels, persistence. How do you know when to stop, when to keep going, when to, you have a why, you have a belief, you have a mission? Is there a moment where you're like, it's not worth it, it's too hard? Or is that when you should push? When you think it's too hard, is that when you're actually closer than you've ever been? I want to talk about that. How many times a day, like the science behind negative emotions and how many times a day we think, well, this isn't going to work, this is bad, this person's out to get me, um, and how that affects your storytelling, your business, things like that. Okay. Views, reels, television, collaborations, Tom Brady quitting Amazon Influencer Program, and people that wait on a project. That's what I got, Tom. So let's see if Tom's around. How is he doing today? Okay, I'm going to do my pinging. And when we see Tom, let's get, let's get Tom in here. Hey, Lisa, how you doing today? Okay. We are going to ping a few people. Tom, jump in when you want to jump in here. Not the smartest guys in the room. Hey, Holly, what's going on? 724, Prof T in the house. I was saying we are going to talk about some subjects here. Views. How hard is it when you make something emotionally, something you believe in, and you get no views? You know, like sometimes I made something the other day on YouTube, and all of a sudden they said there was a a rights, you know, like a, a rights violation, like a copyright violation on it. I, I had no idea. I, I, there was nothing that I did, but I guess I was at the beach and maybe some music was playing in the background or something and somehow it got picked up on. But I'm like, this is my video that I made myself. And then they gave it like, then it gets zero views. And I'm like, oh man, this stinks. So should I, should I be broken hearted? Should I not make another video or... Tom, I'm going down this rabbit hole of of views and how the reality is that happens. Like right now, we're in, we we do this, we we live stream it. We also do a clubhouse. Right now, there's me and you in the room. I did yeah, a right. room today. I did a room the other day where it was just me. Tis life. I'm still here today. I didn't. I'm not broken hearted by it. I made videos about it because it, it's the reality, you know of putting yourself out there. Sometimes you fall down. Some Really, sometimes you fall in the mud. Sometimes you do a video. and you, I watched a YouTube video the other day. I'm thinking about going to California again. And a lady was doing a video and she had like bread in her teeth or something. And then when she made, then in the video, she pointed, like when she edited, she pointed to the bread in her teeth. And she's like, bread in teeth. How did I, how did I not know this was there? You know? So sometimes you get, you fall down, you get kicked, but that is not a reason to quit. So what's going on with you, man? Let's, let's go into that. Well, we'll uh, invite some people, see what's going on in clubhouse today, but welcome Tom. Thanks buddy. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, speaking of not the smartest guys in the room, uh, I'm late this morning cause I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> and let me, uh, let me let me qualify that uh, that statement. So basically, I have this weird thing. Um, and if I'm looking away, if you're on the live stream, if you're seeing this, if I'm looking away, it's just because I'm pinging people into the room as I'm talking uh, on Clubhouse. But anyway, I have this weird thing uh, that Becky and I laugh about uh, where for some reason, I don't know if I'm the only person that does this, but whatever time I look at my watch, right? If I look at my watch, and my watch says it's 8.30, right? Until I look at my watch again in my brain, it's 8.30. So like I, I am perpetually like running late for things and I have been my whole life. And it's not what people would have you believe is like, I don't respect other people's time and like, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's not true at all. I, I, am, I am very aware of the value of other people's time. I spend, I don't know how many, how many times a day I say thank you to people for giving me their time. When we, whenever we have meetings, I always 
you know, do my best to make sure that people know how grateful I am uh, for them spending time with me, uh, working with me, helping with helping me, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not that I'm not cognizant of people, the value of people's time. It's that for some reason, time stands still in my head until I look at my watch again. Like it's 830. If I looked at my watch at 830 and 10 minutes later in my brain, if you asked me what time it was, I'd be like, oh, it's like 832. Like I have no concept of time unless I'm looking at a clock, like unless I check the clock. So I don't know what the solution is. Like, I don't know if I like if I have to get in the habit of like looking at my watch like every minute of the day to really be like on top of what time it is or um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't like do I need to be obsessive about time? Uh, but it's like that's why I was running late this morning is because I'm an idiot. And like I I I thought I had more time than I had. <laughs> like it's that simple. That's fair. So what about how do you get up in the morning? Alarm clock. But I but I also am a I'm a I'm a snoozer. Which mm -hmm. like anybody who is, you know, anybody who's yeah. big on like sleep and and quality of sleep and sleep hygiene and all of that will uh uh Becky's friend uh Dr. Shelby Harris who's a a sleep specialist. Uh, would absolutely lambast me for uh, for the amount that I hit snooze. It's 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 not like a it's not like a once in a while thing. It is guaranteed every morning I hit snooze at least once or twice. Um. So yeah, so I'm a I'm a big I'm a big snoozer, but alarm clocks. I always have alarms in the morning. Okay, so I'm. It's funny because you go down this sleep thing, and I I I got up at five o'clock for a whole, you know, for a whole year, set goals at times, like to write, write a certain screenplay when I was in pharmaceuticals. One time I had a boss that was, I was on, I was knew I was leaving pharmaceuticals soon. And I had a boss one time we were on our way to the airport. I was dropping him off and he's like, well, Dominic, you're going to have to figure out what you want to do. And like, he's calling me to action, like thinking I'm going to double down on pharmaceuticals or something. And from that day forward, I set my alarm for, for the next year for, 501 and finished a screenplay I was working on because I considered it like a currency or something that I wanted to have done before I left that world. So 501, great, worked. But then sometimes I see these people that are so into like, you got to get up early, you got to get up early, you got to maximize your day. And then I see them at three o'clock and they're like taking a nap or at 11 o'clock, they go to bed at nine. And I'm like, well, why if let's say me, I stay up till 1130, you know, that's, I probably start going to bed at 11.15 or something like that by 12. I'm sleeping by midnight every night. I get up at 6.15, 6.20, set the snooze. I'm up, 6.30, 6 6.40. 6 I'm up. I'm up. That's my day. Why am I wrong for not getting up at 5 when I stayed up later, you know, and somebody else is like, I'm better than you because I got up at 5. I, You know, so I, I wonder about that, Tom. And then the alarm question or could you set alarms throughout the day for different things? Would your phone be beeping all day long? Or, is it, you know, I, I, you wear like, you, do you still wear a physical watch? Oh, yeah, I wear a watch and I get alerts on it all the time. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I get calendar alerts. But again, it's like unless I look at the time. Time stands still. Yeah, it's that's very weird. weird. It's a weird it's a weird quirk of mine. I think, I don't know. Like I'm the only person I've ever, it's hard. Like it, I only recently figured out how to like verbalize it. So, so like I'm the only person that I know of that like verbalizes it this way. Right. That like basically in my mind, you know, it, uh, it, it doesn't, time doesn't pass unless I'm like, unless I check the clock and I kind of update, whatever time it was I last saw, like I have to continually like update it in order for me to like recognize the time is passing. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, I'm, I'm super weird. I fully own that. Like I'm I a weirdo. don't think it's weird. Maybe you're just in flow. You guys know about this flow where there's a certain point of the day where you're most productive. You're, you're in the zone. You're most productive. You're not looking at the clock. Is it in, is could Tom have found flow and he's above a clock? You know, is it 
I, I don't, I'm, the the amount of times a day that this happens to me, I would say absolutely not. Okay, <laughs> but so, thanks, so, thanks for the benefit of that doubt. But I, <laughs> but I don't think so at all. <laughs> okay, so let's. We got uh, Joyce and Heather around. And that looks like Janina. Janina, um, so we we'll get we invite everybody out, but we're talking. Oh, we lost you, Dom, because somebody's somebody's trying to call you. You're popular, so you're muted. You're muted, buddy. Can't hear you. Can't hear you at all. Don't know what you're talking about. Oh, Don't know who you're silent? talking to. We lost you because somebody was trying to somebody was trying to call you. You got popular and, oh, and it man, yeah, muted yeah, you. Uh, so I don't. We, none of us have any idea what you said. I'm sure it was okay. Okay, I'm sure it was brilliant. I'm sure it was okay. Brilliant. So anybody watching the live stream, I'm just going to clear my head. Tom says Tom was late today, and I started talking. I swear I was talking for the first three minutes of the room with my thing on mute. So shit happens, right? We we are so that's really what we wanted. To, what we started talking about today times we screw up, times where we get no views, times where we think of quitting, times where all goes wrong. And then what do you do? Like, should I quit when I get zero views? Should I quit when the, like, as an author, should you quit the day, one day when it's day one and somebody doesn't buy your book? Should you quit before I talk to people every day that wrote a book and never released it? Like, should you quit before you even start? Like, so let's talk about that. What do we do? Tom, you want to lead us off or should we go right to Joyce and Heather and Julie? I I do have one thing I want to say on the views. I just want to like reiterate this. Um, and, And like you're talking about when you were talking about that YouTube video, you're talking about like a very specific situation where for reasons unbeknownst to you, something triggered a copyright, uh, flag and the video got pulled down on YouTube and like that kind of like, because again, most of most of the time when that happens, it's an automated system that's doing it. Um, and and, uh, you know, when it's like when it's a random thing and you can't figure out why they flagged it. Right. Um, it's like a random system that's doing it. Uh, and and there's not really a lot you can do. You can appeal, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, should happen sometimes. Right. What are you going to do when it overall comes to like people getting discouraged by like a lack of views on a piece of content or a video? My response to that is, why did you make the piece of content? Like, why did you make the video, right? If you're posting a video and you're worried about the views, then are you making it for you? Because the views are a vanity metric for you, right? You're worried about the views because you don't feel good because not a lot of people saw what you put out there. So what you're saying is they're not looking at me and I want them to look at me. Right. So like, why are you making the video? If you're making it for your audience, then every view doesn't matter if it's five or five million. Every view is valuable to you. Right. You appreciate every view. So do you want to reach a lot of people with your message? Do you want to impact a lot of people? Absolutely. Then I get you want to have a lot of views. But I think really what you need to think about or what people need to think about, I don't mean you, Dom, because I know you were talking about a very different situation. But you know, what people need to think about is why they're making the content, if they're truly making the content for their audience, which is why they should be making the content, then the views really shouldn't matter too much. Like the number shouldn't matter too much. If it's 100 or 500 really shouldn't make any difference. um, In terms of whether or not they continue doing the work that they're doing. So that's what I think when it comes to views. Okay, let's let's go down it. Let's go down this rabbit hole. And we are let's just be clear, we're not saying views are bad, or that, you know, maybe, maybe you your message got out to more people because of that, you know, like, you're like, hey, well, on this day, it was the per I wrote the, the perfect book, the perfect message. And I just want the whole world to see it. Well, yeah, that's honorable, right? And I, where I would when I thought about this, um, in our friend Chris Worth's book, he tells this story about Pound the Stone, Pound the Stone, where all of a sudden, and that's a famous book, but he tells the story of you pound on this stone, like if you're making a sculpture, you pound, you don't see it, you pound, you don't see it, you don't see the result. And then all of a sudden, at, on the hundredth chop or pound of the stone, all of a sudden, bam, you start to 
the thing starts to take shape. I was reading Ed Millett's book the other day, and he goes the same way with a pinata. Here you are with a, a little kid or something smashing at the pinata. Don't see it. Don't see it. Don't see it. And but you really are making an impact. And so where I wanted to just offer um, positive vibes or whatever to anybody, you know. Think where you are compared to five years ago, or you know, when you were sitting there thinking, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get on Clubhouse. I'm gonna create a profile. I'm gonna create a thumbnail picture. I'm gonna work on this book." So you've come a long way. So Joyce, Joyce, Heather, let's start talking. Let's let's talk about these subjects. Joyce, you want to weigh in? What are you thinking today? And how are you doing, cannabis mom? Good morning. Um, yeah, that's sort of the bane of my existence. You know that we're. Uh, what I call it, microdosing narcissism. You know, I, I want my, my contact to engage with people so I can start changing the narrative. But then if I don't get enough views or I don't feel like it's made an impact, I don't know what to do. I, I just, I don't know. Social media confuses me. I know I have to be on it. I'm getting more consistent. I'm actually trying to use it more as a marketing tool. So the irony of being a creator who hates social media, who I don't actually like to use it, is that I'm on it to help promote other people. I don't know. I think I'm kind of messed up in this world, but I like listening to you to hear what you say because it does make me feel better because I know that I'm doing what I need to do and that views and whatever the metrics are aren't necessarily like as important as somehow you kind of internalize it as being. So that's where I am. <laughs> and I had a hard time finding you guys this morning. Yeah, thank you. Happening. I thank you. And I wondered about that because same views. Uh, let's talk like reality of it. The, what got me thinking about this too, and I made some TikToks about it and stuff. I had a clubhouse room the other day. I do a inspirational room on Monday. We talk storytelling that um, has an inspirational note, and it's got a hundred people in the club. Not a you know that's not the hugest club or anything like that. But all of a sudden, I was in there by myself that day, and it's funny. I had something the other day on TikTok hit uh, two hundred. It hit, and it's been there for a while. It hit two hundred forty thousand views. In the same week, I'm sitting in a room with a zero, you know what I mean? And thinking, well, this hit, this doesn't hit. And I didn't, either one, I made a video and you might have realized that I shared that story of sitting there with zero people in the room. Me and Tom sit here today. I was talking with my microphone off. Tom, <laughs> Tom couldn't find his hat and uh, there was nobody in the room. Man, it's life and we didn't quit. We just keep. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Okay, but we need a pause real quick. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The pause is our man Charlie Cifarelli is in the in the room. Charlie Cifarelli, dear friend of ours. Um, Charlie had some started sharing his story. Beautiful story about him and Star, his his family, his journey, and had um. I don't I don't know if he minds me saying he had some battles with illness over the. Uh, over the holiday season, and it got pretty dark for him. Charlie, I'm just thrilled you're here. If you want to come up and say, if you just want to say hi, if you want to say you're kicking life's ass, if you want to say you're on the mend, but it warms my soul to see you here. So, Charlie, I'm changing the order, and Charlie, you can say whatever the heck you want. So, go on, my friend. Hey, hello, everybody. Charlie, haven't been vocal for quite a while now, and you're fine with everything you said, Dominic. I had a a stroke on November 16th at two o'clock in the morning, I woke up to this monster. And unfortunately for me, I was home alone. Jim was in Texas on a medical conference and I didn't know what had happened to me because I suffer from a uh, pretty bad hip impingement. I thought it was a nerve because I got out of bed and I collapsed. So not to give a sob story, but it took 17 hours before I got medical attention. And, um, you know, I'm not used to that. I, I've enjoyed good health my whole life, and it's a different place to be when they're asking you over and over, do you have a living will? Do you have a living will? Um, it's a different place to be at, and it's a different place to have half your body paralyzed, and it's a different place when you you can't go to the bathroom anymore. Um, but by the grace of God, I got a little feeling back in my arm and leg and um, I got mad one day and I threw my walker and I started doing some walking. So uh, I'm not back to where I was, 
But I, my message to people today is this. Please, please go easy with each other. We don't know what each of us are going through. And we don't know how much time we ourselves have. So for anybody saying that they have a cornerstone on health, I'm here to tell you I have A1C in the fours. I'm not diabetic. I don't have high blood pressure. I don't, I'm not a risk factor. Nobody in my family has had a stroke. But a simple blood clot went deep into the brain cell, brain stem of my brain, and stopped blood flow. And that's a problem. And that could happen to anybody. It could happen to somebody that's just been battling COVID. We don't, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the body. So be easy with each other. If you're enjoying good health and you feel good, be kind to your neighbor. And everything happens for a reason. What is my message today? My message today is that I am so grateful to be alive. I am so grateful for the little things in life. And I can cry right now because the medical staff treated me like family. And I'm a big guy to pick up and get out of bed to go to the bathroom. And they did that because I didn't want a diaper and I didn't want a catheter. And they continually got me out of bed and they got me to stand up. And it was a big deal. And they did that for me. And I know it's their job, but they did their job with an incredible grace and great attitude. So I'm glad to be back here today, people. Um, and and as far as uh, I talked about Tom, you know, Tom, somebody repurposed one of my videos on a software underbelly. And I thought we all heard enough of it. So people are enjoying it again now. So things are good. A lot of book sales off of that. And I'm grateful to be here. That's enough out of me. Hey, Charlie, can we give Charlie a clap, man? Just welcome back. And he's been one of our, yeah, he's, he's been a supporter, a friend, um, just a guy trying to make a difference and do some good. So, um, yeah, thank you. Man. I, I don't need to say anything. Yeah. Just, yeah, thank you, Charlie. Glad you're here, man. Um, get, keep, keep on that mend forward. So, uh, appreciate it. Okay, let's get, just get, we're going to keep on flowing here. Charlie, look at all this love, man. Look at, look at the love for Charlie Cifarelli. So, uh, yeah, he's getting, he deserves it, man. So, he's just a guy that really, um, wants to make a difference and help other people. Never asking for you in in the year or so I've known him. Never, never asked for anything. You know, just going out there and making a difference. So, not the smartest guys in the room. Let's get back. I was talking about. We were talking. Yeah, they're clapping. We were talking about view. No views. We were talking about being on mute. We were talking about those days when you're like, shit. These five people owe me money and my bills are due. Maybe. I used to be in pharmaceuticals. Maybe I should go back to pharmaceuticals. You know, maybe we're talking about those times and it gets tough where you're like, okay, stay the course. Is my message getting out there? So uh, Heather, we're back. We're Heather. We're going to go to Heather, Julie, Jess, and then Elise. God, and then keep on rolling across here. And you can talk about whatever, whatever you want. Views and reels and collaborations. Tom Brady quitting Amazon, Amazon influencer program sitting on projects, not putting them out. Those were a few of the things on the list today. Okay, Heather, go where you want to go. Well, I just wanted to say good morning and um, self-love and healing to you, Charlie. That is, I'm so, we're so glad that you're here. Um, and I just wanted to say that, but, you know, <sighs> I really don't even know where to go at this point because we, you would say when a five people owe you a bunch of money and it's like, that's where I'm at right now because like I have, there's this like really long time client that I have and I've known this individual since high school and you know, it's, it's really difficult to work with somebody who kind of doesn't value your work in a way and won't pay you your fair amount. Um, and you know, it's just, you know, I have a meeting with them tomorrow about it and you know, I'm um, actually, I'm going to go look right now. I have been with this person. I'm looking at my invoices because I have literally all of the invoices since 2014. 
I have been with this client since 2014 and they, I've not raised rates on them at all. And when I try, they don't let me. And so basically with rising interest rates, rising costs, um, inflation, um, giving my workers raises. I'm literally working for this person for free and it's difficult to stand up for myself and say, Hey, I need to be paid so I can pay my people so that I'm not losing money working with you because it's so I'm just having a really difficult time on like, because I've known this person forever. I don't know if I should let them go because I've known them forever. One, two, they run in multiple circles that I've run in, in regards to business. So, you know, um, loose lips (laughs) sort of issue. Um, so I'm not really sure where I should go and, and what to do if I should let them go. Or if I just say like bite, you know, bite the bullet and be like, fine, I'll just keep her at a low rate. And like, I just, it's, it's really difficult to stand up for yourself. And especially when you know this individual for so long and you run in the same circles and they consider you a friend, but then they don't treat you as such. And so it's just really difficult. So I have a meeting with them tomorrow and I have like almost 10 years of invoices proving that I've not raised rates on her and it's time. And it's not my fault that the business is struggling, quote unquote, all the time. Um, if that's Heather, the case, then you should, you know, put money elsewhere. I don't know. I don't know. So I'm looking for I, advice to Heather, be Heather, honest. Can I, okay. Can so I, I ask you a question, Heather? Yes, Tom. I'll wait. Uh, all right. Awesome. So what does this, what does this person do? Do they, do they, what do they sell? What are their services? Like, are they there? Like, what are they in business to do? That's a loaded question because this individual has wears many hats. Um, they are in the hospitality industry. They're also in the pageant industry. They're okay. also in the podcast industry. Um, so, you know, there's multiple things that I'm involved with. Okay. Um, so hosp- hospitality, let's just focus on one. Hospitality in what way? In what way are they in, they in the hospitality industry? Food and Bev. So and they bev. have like, two so, freaking waters. So- they have what? Sorry. They have two br- two locations, like two different concepts, two locations, but literally right okay. next door to one another. So. Okay. So so like restaurant eatery kind of thing, bar. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So they operate two businesses on slim margins, right? And Dom can specifically talk uh, with some authority to how slim the margins are in the restaurant industry. I've never run a restaurant. Dom has, I have friends who have, but I know that industry operates on very thin margins. Right. So like, you know, I mean, I, I would turn it back on them. I would say, look, like I, I have done my best over the last 10 years to not raise rates. And I would, I would actually, I would, I would admonish you for not raising rates for them on them for 10 years. Um, I think, you should have. And I think you've kind of made it a little bit harder on yourself by not slowly bringing the rate up over time. Every time I tried, but I've tried, that's the thing. And she, the individual's like, we can't afford it. We're struggling. We might have to close our doors, but it's literally like every year. That's the same thing. I'm like, well, why haven't you closed the doors yet? I would be willing to bet money that you are not the only vendor they do this to. This sounds like a pattern of behavior and I, my response to that, and it's, it might sting in the short term, but it's going to benefit you in the long term. My response to that is, here's the rate. And when they turn around and say they can't afford it, then you say, well, then I'm really sorry, but I don't think we can work together anymore. Period. Like, that's it. Because you're running a business and you just say to them, look, I'm running a business too. And I understand that there are struggles, but I cannot afford to do this work for you at this rate any longer, right? I've done my best to be as patient with you as I possibly can be. But at the end of the day, like, uh, Heather, this sounds like a client you got to fire. And like, you got to fire them five years ago. Um, <laughs> so like, that's my advice is cut them loose. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Hold, okay. hold on. I want, I, I, want in on, I, want, I want in on this too. So if if the rate's the rate and they don't want to go up up on the rate, why can't you reduce the work? 
And so I'm just, I've done that and I've reduced the work to the point in which it's like they're in, they're complaining on the level of service now. And I'm like, well, I need to, I've told you this, you know what I mean? I've, I'm like, I, because you cannot afford my rate, I need to reduce the amount in which we are posting. Um, there cannot be multiple edits anymore. Um, you know, we even give the courtesy of giving content prior to scheduling and then we make one round of edits, but like now, and we even should give captions. She has to approve it. But then, you know, if something goes wrong and there's a caption, she doesn't like that's scheduled. She'll turn around and be like, well, why was that posted? I didn't approve that. And we're like, we give you the, we give everything to you. So it's, it's to the point where, it's costing me money for sure. A hundred percent. It's costing me money. Tom's given the throat slash motion in a positive way. And you are, you are not a bank. I'm, I'm not a bank. You can never work at a loss. You are there, Heather, you are trying to feed yourself and your family. So you are not in, it is not a, not a 501 C. So um, I just think you got to cut, cut that. You can't, you can't do it. Go. Heather, Heather, oh. fire them and know that you should not in any way, shape, or form feel guilty about it. You are protecting so, your business. I, I, Yeah, but what do I do about the possible backlash that comes with it? Um, because like I said, they're in my community very well, okay. strongly. Let's go. Community. Dr. Tachi wants to answer this. Go on, Dr. Tachi. Dr. Tachi, then Julie. Go on. Already, I don't like this person, Heather. I'm sorry. I just had to say that. Uh, because, you know, I've dealt with a uh, similar thing. Yeah, I, I don't like this person already. This person is not your friend, whether or not they consider if they treat all their friends like that, then I feel sorry for the other people in the community. And here's the thing. One community does not hinge on, on one person. I doubt very. I think you're giving her way too much power. And again, I don't know the situation, but I think she people treat you how you allow them to treat you. And she is treating you this way because you're allowing it. And I doubt that the level of power that you're ascribing to her within your community really has as much uh, power. And if it does, then maybe that's not a community that you need to be in. You need to be where it's going to affirm you in terms of business and personally, because I can tell that this is also affecting you personally. So this person doesn't have your best interest in mind. She is thinking about her and her only, because if she was thinking about you, she would realize that you two are in business, business and you need to profit and survive as well. So because of that, you have to think about you because she's not thinking about you. And I doubt that any, that there will be backlash that will have a serious effect. And even if it does, even if it does, then those are not the type of people you need to be around anyway. I know it's very simplistic, but file the divorce papers. I will help you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tachi. I love that. Uh, I mean, maybe I am giving this individual too much power, um, but yeah, it's just, it's a difficult, it's a difficult situation since the longevity of which we've been working together, the history that we have of literally going to high school together <laughs> and, um, and the community in which we're in, which is local, it's Delaware. I mean, shit, like I could throw a rock and like hit five people that I know without even trying. So um, the community is small. And so I just worry about, you know, loose lips, sanctions. You know, you know what uh, I mean, <laughs> and really quickly, I'm sorry, uh, Tom, just, just to add to that. So if I have a similar situation where like we're firing a client and even though I'm in a big area, it is an organization like the community that with it, which it's in is small and people know each other. The difference is I don't give a damn. If people know each other, they can say whatever they like because our work stands for itself. And we, I haven't been working with this client uh, for 10 years like you have. But And these people are not my friends. So it's probably easier for me to say that. But for you, take it from the business perspective, definitely. But if you consider this person your friend, then maybe you need to say something that I'm very disappointed that at some that you consider me a friend and you disregarded my well-being this way. Maybe she hasn't even considered that because this is probably the way, as Tom said, she treats 
other clients and probably everyone in her life, nobody, and nobody says anything, she probably doesn't even know. So maybe you need to say something if, if that friendship part is important. I, I release the mic. Julie, did you want to say something? Hi guys, I'm really chomping at the bit of this. Um, so, you know, I love everything Dr. Tachi just said. And I, I experienced situations like this in, I would say, the past year where I had to make Sophie's choice. And for all you guys that are, like, really young, you probably don't know what it is, but it's like choosing one child. Who's going to live? One, this child or the other? And what I want to say to Heather is how important is it to keep your business alive? Are you thinking in terms of a CEO, a businesswoman, or are you like letting your emotions come in? Because these, this is how businesses fail when we are leading with our emotions. Uh, you know, when we are making decisions based on, I don't want to make them feel bad. And this is a lot of women too. And trust me, I had like a huge wake up call last year in terms of this. And I'm like, okay, do I want my business to thrive or do, do I want it to just be surviving. Uh, she does not care. She is leading with her greed and ego. And for you to recognize that, you don't have to part ways in a cataclysmic way. You know, this is your policy. This is what you do. And if she wants to be part, you know, be a client still, she's going to pay you. Otherwise, it's going to bleed over. And it's taking up so much time and space in your head as well, Heather. Like, what could you be doing with all this time in terms of instead of worrying about this quote unquote friend and uh, early on client, you could be doing so many more things. And unfortunately, you know, this is the way of business. So I just want to just remind you that you are a CEO, a badass boss. And, you know, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that it's not personal, it's business. So thank you. That's all. Sorry. Good stuff, Joel. Good stuff. And hey, they might, you might, Heather, because you're such a good friend to them and because you're so busy, you might refer them to another, uh, not somebody else that you think could work with them at this point, but you might not be the right person for them. So here, here's a name, call them. And they, they yeah, probably... I actually have like two people in mind for that. And Julie, yeah, I mean, I'm trying not to put my emotion into it, but the emotion isn't like sad or mad. It's more like nervous and scared that loose links like this. They're well, so interconnected. Um, you are, you are worth it. You're like worth a certain dollar amount. And yeah. she's the worst by dictating this to you. Yes. You've been there for her. It doesn't mean you're not going to be her friend. You'll support her. But like in terms of business, you know, you can't be wasting your time on this little stuff especially when you're losing money with her as a client at the time. Yeah. And the crazy thing is I have never received a referral from her ever in the last nine years. Oh, I have, I have clients that refer me out literally the month that we start and that it's crazy. I've had so <laughs> like even, yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I guess I need to weigh the pros and cons here and, um, get my ducks in a row and it's hard too. I get it. It's hard. A thousand percent. I, I I know it's I'm I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to you next prof T. I see you I see you chomping at the bit also and I'm sure you've got some great insight here. I just wanted to add in one more thing before I forget. I know it's super easy for me to sit here and say fire the client, right? Um and I know it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, but I think you absolutely have to do it in this case. And the other thing too, when you're when you talk about this nervousness, because you're you you're concerned that she's going to go around and badmouth you um, and damage your business and damage your reputation in the in the community that you're in. I wouldn't be surprised if I'm right that this is a pattern of behavior, that this is how she treats vendors to try to drive down her costs right with vendors and to keep costs low and to try to get the bargain basement rate she can out of everyone. If I'm right, that this is a pattern of behavior, then I I would not be surprised if you let her go and all of a sudden people start coming out of the woodwork going, oh my God, I had the worst experience working with this person. Oh my God, I had to stop working with them for the same reasons. Oh, they were always trying to under like uh to cut costs with me and to and to you know bargain you know haggle my rates down and stuff like that. I had a I had a situation where I got referred to a friend. This was not somebody I worked with for a long time. 
I got referred through a friend, somebody who I have continued to work with to do work for a friend of theirs. Um, I delivered the work uh, in the agreed upon time frame, and they turned around after the fact and told me that they didn't believe the work was worth what I charged for it. And they had already agreed to pay the rate and they tried to, they tried to undercut me and tried to pay me less than they had agreed to pay because they, they argued that the work ultimately wasn't worth what I had quoted them. And, uh, I turned around and I said, look, if you, if you don't want to pay the rate, that's great. The next correspondence you're going to get is going to be from my attorney. So let me know how you want to handle this. I'm happy to take it to court, but like either way you're paying what you agreed to pay. And, and I've never worked with them since, and it didn't damage my reputation at all. Turned out that they had a really bad reputation of doing the same garbage to other people. And I found out after the fact, but I was nervous. Like in that exchange, I was really nervous about the repercussions. So I get it um, to some extent as much as I can, but I, I think you got to do it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you, uh, if, you, uh, if you see people coming out of the woodwork to tell you that they've had similar experiences with this person. So um, I wish you the best of luck and, and definitely, you know, stay in touch with us. Let us know how things turn out and, uh, you know, feel free to reach out outside of this if, if I can be of any more help. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. 100%. 100%. Stay the course. Don't give up. Keep your head up. My dad told me one time when I was, I was, I was, bro, I was in the restaurant business. This is a good segue. So my answer to that was five cents on the dollar is what the restaurant makes at the end of the day. Then I'm sitting here thinking while you're talking, coming out of COVID, the eggs, eggs are up, chick, there's a chicken flu, all kinds of crap like that. So I'm thinking, yeah, I could see why the things are tighter than they've been. So they, I mean, they haven't increased in their world because their struggle may be different right now. So, but that's not your reality. But so I'm in the restaurant business. I used to be in the restaurant business. And at one point I'm going broke. You know, I owe about probably at this point, we'll say I owed about 400,000 and like debt that was due right then. And I know I'm about to close. I'm trying to avoid going to jail and all this stuff's going on. And my dad came in one day and my dad's a landscaper. And I used to have like, I'd ask my dad to come in at lunch, like on a winter day, cause he'd be out plowing and nobody'd be there at that time. Or, or I'd get the waitresses to sit up in the front window of the restaurant to look like there was people there. And my dad said, he said, Dominic, he said, keep your head up, even if you got to put it on the curb. And so whatever it takes to, to keep that head up, even if you got to go out, crawl outside and keep it on the curb um, to lift your, to lift that chin, that's something that has stuck with me to this day. So um, stay the course, Heather. Not the smartest guys in the room. Aye, aye. Okay. Somebody said this to me the other day, Tom, and it, um, it, was, it was something that, like, I believe in being self-deprecating, and I also believe I am not the smartest guy in the room. They said... You shouldn't do that. They said, why would you? And I have told people that, that at times, like, oh, why would you, why would you be little or something? You know, why, why would you do it? Is that something, is that something we do? It's tongue in cheek. That's, like, what, I, look, that's what I thought. I yeah. don't think I'm stupid, but I also know that there are people out there smarter than me, especially when it comes to fields of expertise. And that's really what we're talking about. But it's tongue in cheek, right? It's fun. It's funny. Like, ah, forget it. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, I'll happily I say I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Somebody I called, called myself an idiot it. earlier. I am. Said, I'm an idiot. They said you shouldn't ways. do that. And they, but yeah, I, I, I heard that. And, okay. Not the smartest guys in the room. We started the room today. I was on mute. Tom wasn't here. I was in a club. Joyce said she tried to find this room and had trouble finding it. I thought the other day I mentioned that I had a clubhouse. It was me and me only. It reminded me of a time where I was selling books at the county fair and they gave me the stage at lunchtime on like a hot Saturday or Sunday and uh, nobody was there except for the people eating and I would just like randomly talk about life with the people, the five people in the back of the audience. Hey, but maybe I made an impact to that one person. But okay, that's where we're going. Anyway, Julie. Wait, where do you want to go? Then we're going to get to Prof T, Dr. Tachi, and keep this conversation going. Views. Well, Charlie. I got sidetracked with Charlie and Heather, so I don't even remember what we're talking about. Oh, okay, let me. here's your subjects. So we started off with this idea of, like, are we defined by the views? Are we scared of the views? Are we paralysis by analysis? Because 
well, I only got 10 views. I wonder how many people in here, I wonder how many people in this room have deleted stuff because it didn't have a lot of views. Mm. Who's guilty of that? I wonder, or they're, but go on, Julie. So, I mean, you have clients, you're helping clients with messaging. So early on, when you start crafting your message and sharing your story, you might have one connection. You might, it might be your first podcast, your first post on social media. How do we stay the course, Julie? Well, and I know Tom and I like agreed on this before. It doesn't really matter. Social media, it's, you know, the, he always hanging the sign outside the brick and mortar, if you will. You have to have it so people know you're there, but it has nothing to do. And I have clients who have like 100,000, 200,000 um, thousand, um, followers, if you will. And you know, they post a picture of like them with their dog. They get tons of engagements and following, and then they do something like business like and they get nothing. So it's about like showing a little glimpse of yourself, showing a little bit of vulnerability, not too much. And it's also not putting too much energy into social media. It, engagement is everything, followers, likes, or nothing. I mean, do we all have that big of an ego that we think we need to have five? Hundred likes, five thousand likes. Does that make? Where does that? How does that move the boat? How does that push us forward? How does that propel us forward? I can't, in my mind, reconcile a good answer on that other than you have to have a presence online, and that's it. So, I am complete. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Julie. If social media goes away tomorrow, would you be all right? Would you still be there? Yeah, I, I still, I, you know, I'd show up 50 different places tomorrow, you know, still be podcasting or still be down in town, handing out, do handing out meals or whatever I'm doing. I, it, would it impact me? I feel like people have been, I feel like the demigod uh, social media have brainwashed us to think that if we're less than, if we don't, it's it's it's, it's, it's just a, it's a way to grab it's a way to grab some attention get your get, I mean it it has its values but uh, okay not the smartest guys in the room but I just saw the Surgeon General said people under thirteen shouldn't be on it it well it has its good it also has its evil you know and if you have a complete understanding of it like us talking some days we get in here and we talk about algorithms well the reason why well understanding it's not that you did something bad when you posted something and your friend didn't like it. I talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Like I've never looked at who, I didn't even know you could do that, that looked at who liked your post. Your friend might not have saw it. It might not have showed up in their algorithm. And what, you think they have time to just scroll on you individually and look up your stuff? I read this book, um, Del, it was Del Carnegie. It was How to Stop Worrying. And it, this is like one of Del Carnegie's lesser known books. And, he said, this is 80 years ago, he said, people care more about their own headache than if, if you die, you know, so they're not scrolling in this. He said it, so it's not me. He, he Like, they're not scrolling on your personal account looking for t every, updates every half hour from you. They're just living their life. So not the smartest guys in the room. Prof T, what's going on? Uh, hey, Prof T, I saw you up on a big stage. It looked quite impressive. There was... Um, it, her grid system was behind her. Prof T is out doing events. So Prof T, teach us a little. Tell us what you got going on. How can we be like you? Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. My my mind is reeling all of the great conversation in this room. Um, so yeah, I was actually um, invited to speak at a school of the trades. It's a very well-known college here in the area. And it's for young men who are um, looking to be in the trades. It's a great school. You need to look it up, Williamson Trade School. Um, anyway, yeah, so I was there speaking about the grid system and achieving success through resilience. It was a really good opportunity. I'm doing a lot of speaking. Um, you know, it's what I do, and it's it's what I have been aspiring to do. And And COVID put a kibosh on it for a little bit. And so, um, you know, again, thanks to Julie, who really helped me to perfect my, um, 
my calling, so to speak. And so it's been really paying off. Social media wise, yeah, I'm going to say two things, but I want to back up real quick. Uh, Heather, um, I'd love to just hang out with you, talk with you. Listen, I, I'm, I'm in Glen Mills, where you are in Delaware. I, you know, I, I'm six miles from the Delaware border. So many companies start LLCs in the state of Delaware because of the, it's such a lower fee. Um, taxes are extremely low. The cost of living is a lot lower. I get it, Heather. You got to be careful how you start, you know, adding up your your numbers. But you are of value, and I just want you to know that you're not going to be wrong. It's the way of the world right now. Anyway, I have a lot of respect for you. Love what you do. When one door closes, a window at least will open. I promise you. And let's get together. Um, and you're yes, also, and yeah. that's Glen Mills, PA, correct? Yep. Okay. So I that's... have a um, client up there, so we should get lunch. Let's do it. Um, let's do it. Let's do it. And I'm going to back channel you and invite you to something too. So well, here's what I'm saying about social media. Cause I've been in a lot of rooms, you guys, and everyone's clamoring about, I got this many and I got that many, I got these many followers and that many followers. And you know, if you want to make money, you got to have all these followers and you, gotta blah, 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 blah. and you know, sometimes followers don't equal paid customers, paid clients, paid speaking gigs. And I believe that just keep doing what you're doing. And, and I'm going to answer the question you asked. <clears throat> yeah, I've deleted stuff. I've gone back and like, oh my goodness, look at my hair, look at my face, the quality's terrible. And I've deleted it. And since being in this room, um, for as long as I've been with you guys, I've learned one thing. Don't do that. I learned that from you guys, Dom and Tom. Don't do that. I I keep them up there. Somebody might see. I've got people clicking on something from three, four, five months ago. Oh, wow. But here's what I'll land with, you guys. I'm already doing what I'm doing, and I'm very successful. I've, I've already been successful with coaching and counseling in my private practice and speaking. I don't need millions of followers to validate me. However, with COVID, it opened up a whole new world. So I was able to get my book published. I'm now speaking internationally. And there are values that you can place on how it helps you. So don't throw the baby out in the bathwater, but don't let it define you. Keep doing what you're doing. And you know what? People like Julie, who helped me to get to the next level in rooms like this where I learn and I connect with people. Um, and Charlie, I love you. God bless you. You know, Charlie and I live about two hours away. Charlie, you're about 15 minutes from where my sister lives. So I'm looking forward to seeing you when you are ready for um, uh, some company or some, some socialization. With that said, this is Prof T from Philly, where it is chilly. We got snow. It's cold, but the birds are hot. And I love social media, but it doesn't define me. I define it. Thank you. God bless you. Boom. Thank you, Prof T. I define it. That is good. That is good stuff. You know, like I, I love that idea of I'm going to put out like, and I, 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 I love this idea of putting out the content I, I, that you believe that you believe in, that you want to share. Like if me, I try to share inspiration, positivity, and smiles. I saw that monkey that got saved from the Dallas Zoo today. You know, they found this ran. They two monkeys got stolen, and they found the monkeys. Love it. This is Dominic Damaski's space. You are getting a post about these monkeys at some point. I think I already shared something, but to me, I, and I, I can't wait. It, it's 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 weird. It's quirky. It's inspiration. I'm telling you, you're gonna get it. Now, some people might say, what the hell is this guy posting about this silly monkey for? What the hell is he talking about? You know, well, inspiration, positivity, and smiles. So the content that I share is always something that I hope accomplishes that, that accomplish the content of other people that I help develop and stuff like that. Does it do one of those things? And if it does, well, like those, like those monkeys that they found in an apartment, uh, in a closet of an apartment, Hey, they're inspiring. I'm going to share it. All right. Sorry for my sidebar. I'm continuing here. Okay. So this, we are an eclectic bunch. Make sure you connect with the person above, below, like uh, Prof T and Heather just did. Have a lunch. 
me and Charlie had lunch one day. Me and Stephanie Zoom all all the time. We're dear friends. Me and Tom have a have a show now, and we met over COVID, and have never met face to face. But we were in groups every Thursday night at the beginning of lockdown. We'd sit there for two hours with a bunch of guys from all over the globe, really, and just talk about whatever, you know. So connect however you can. All right. Now, because we're eclectic, because I probably have ADD, which isn't a bad thing, we are talking about persistence. We're talking about views. I'm reading it now. Here's some things that were on the list. Watch this. Here's some things that were on my list. These are my notes. My handwriting, if you're looking at the live screen, my handwriting is not the best. So here's what's on it. Did you ever notice Rush Limbaugh used to always, uh, if you ever listen, every time he read something, he'd always crinkle the papers like this. It was a thing. So anyway, we're talking views, reels, collaborating, Tom Brady quitting. Well, can you quit something? Can you walk away? Hmm. Finally. This Amazon, yeah. This Amazon influencer program. I've got to talk to you guys about it. Sitting on projects. Why do we wait? Persistence, pounding the stone. De are we people that are defined by views, be defined by what everybody else thinks? No, no, no. Okay. Dr. Tachi. You, that's my segue. Now let me prepare you. You, our dear friend, Dr. Tachi, who's been by our side and always drops knowledge and makes us think. Um, where do you want to go, Dr. Tachi? It's all you. Wow, there's a lots. Of, there's lots of places to go. <laughs> so I, be, I guess I, I will stay on the social media trajectory and say that uh, when it comes to uh, followers and all of those vanity metrics, um, I, I think what has made us think it matters is advertisers, right? Because advertisers are only interested, well, they're interested, they're increasingly interested in engagement, but for the most part, they are interested in eyeballs that can see their product. And so because that's what they're interested in, we then have absorbed that interest. Now, if you're doing social media for a client or another thing, certainly you're going to pay attention to some of those things. But you also need to stress to them that the number of followers doesn't necessarily matter. I have been, I do, you know, when I do my lives, especially on Instagram, I look and I, my numbers on Instagram and I only have like 3000 something followers on Instagram, but they are the most engaged that I have ever seen. So there are people that will have that have like 10,000 plus followers and they don't have the amount of people in their live videos that I do. Why? Because I've called to taken the time to cultivate a community and that's what I care about. So social media is about cultivating a community. It's about building, community building, nation building, if you will. It's not uh, about the numbers because you can have a million followers. And if two people ever only comment on your stuff, that's not good metrics. So you know, I think we have to take the metrics with a grain of salt. Again, if you're running social media for someone, you are going to look at how to improve those metrics. And that doesn't necessarily mean upping the follower count. That means, you know, improving the engagement because the engagement is really what matters. And then at the end of the day, the social platforms are great. Use them because they are, and I'm saying this in quotes, free, <laughs> because nothing is ever really free. Use them, but know that you probably need to find a way to get this community to something that you actually own. And we've said this over and over in here. So if that's an email list, if that's an app that you have, is that if that's a platform you're building out, that's what you need to do. Because when these social media platforms, if they have a problem, we see how people uh, run around helter skelter when uh, Facebook is down or Instagram is down. And that's arguably because they probably have not moved their audience elsewhere. So those are two things to think about. Of course, it's about in engagement, but it, uh, uh, it's about engagement, but it's also about using that engagement and saying, hey, I'm also here. Make sure you follow me. So if anything goes wrong here, we always have this community. And I am complete. No, Dr. Dr. Tachi, I don't allow it. So I watch, I watch your videos. And one of the things I noticed about Dr. Tachi's videos is I'm, I'm, I'll be watching. And I don't even know how she does it, but... I'll be watching and sometimes I'll comment and she'll instantly, even with all these people scrolling, she'll make a comment like right in the live stream talking to whoever. Like one day I, I'm like, oh, what do you think about this? And she responds instantly. So besides for that, Dr. Tachi, you got any engagement tips for uh, our eager minds? 
Yes. So what what you what you're talking about? I love people. <laughs> Obviously, I like to, when people come to my house or my virtual house, I like to make sure that they are attended to. So when people come in, you need to be welcoming them in. Even if you did not see them individually, take time periodically to say, let me just take a break and welcome everyone who came in. If I didn't see you, I'm saying hello to you now. That type of thing can make them feel welcome. Make sure that you look down at the comments and, and acknowledge them. So even if that means you have a certain time in your stream when you acknowledge comments, acknowledge them. So you don't have to like, I do them when I see them if, if time allows. If I have a guest, then I let them know, you know what, we'll take some time in a minute to acknowledge all the comments comments and go back. Just let the audience know what you're what you're doing so they know what to expect. You can either do it throughout like I do or you can take specific time and acknowledge, but you need to welcome them to your house and you need to acknowledge their comments because otherwise they could just watch TV if nobody's going to talk to them. That's the whole reason people in, like live streams because it's in the moment engagement. And there you go. Dr. Tachi, that's great. So, and it makes, I, I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, Dr. Tachi's pretty smart. Uh, okay. Hey, Medieval, Stephanie, Simon, L, Monica, Damon, Cynthia, um, Abdul, Abdulba, because of Dr. Tachi's teaching, we, me and Tom admit we're not the smartest guys in the room. So um, it, just acknowledge and we do appreciate everybody that's in the room. I hope you guys know that. And we always try to invite everybody up if you want to, jump up but you're you're right dr tachi and you do a great job with it our, our boy our boy charlie's on the phone oh, somebody we got somebody a little i was gonna say I, i'm looking at my screen here and it shows my, the phone and i see somebody raised their hand so do, 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 do. all right medieval let's see medieval this looks like um that's something this picture he's got here looks like um something my son used to have he was always talking about these things but now i'm reading i uh, got to read his profile move with intention serve with purpose okay i'm in he's got a coffee there it's comfort the com comfort the confused and the confused the comforter no time for hate yeah i agree medieval okay medieval where you weigh in on all this stuff what do you got going on um in what stuff um to be honest i was just listening to i think everybody was just bringing their fair share of information to the table but i don't even know what to talk about to be honest um i could talk about a lot of things um within my life i'm just at a place where i'm just um at the moment I'm, i wouldn't say i own any business i'm just a working guy to be honest um from the uk you know most of my life um yeah i'm just a working guy but um, i'm plain and simple i'm just a naturalist to be honest um i enjoy simple things i'm just like enjoy the simple things finer things in life rather than um, all of this social media and that is probably the only social media i have i have had a few in the past but i've deleted them because it just wasn't me i tried to i don't know and within the sense of all this algorithm and that everybody's just welcoming it like it's all normal and but it's not really like it's not really i don't know it's not natural it is natural in a sense but it's not like if it makes sense because it's like there's algorithms that means there's something in the air sending and taking information it's like i don't know it's like what are we going into and i don't know scary when you really think about it man. taking hey. us away from who we are and whatnot it's like it's taking the roots of a human being away kind of i don't know I could go on all day, but I don't know. What do you lot think? Hey, man. Well, we one, we appreciate you're here. You give us a shot. You check out the room. And don't mind uh, that we cover 50 topics. We got so many experts in the room. We always were like, hey, let's ask them about this. Or there's things that we get together. And so many things happen over the course of a week where we're like, hey, we, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about this. And then as soon as we start talking about it, everybody raises such good points we go down a whole, a whole nother rabbit hole, man. So, uh, hang out, appreciate, uh, like I think Dr. Tachi said it, those, all those media platforms are just distribution. Like they're just another distribution platform. You have your content. So like me, I, I am the, I'm, my business is publishing books. I, that's what I do. I help people tell their story. I love all these other platforms just because I think if my authors aren't there, well, are the people, are the 5 million people that are on Clubhouse or 10 million, are they going to find them? If, I mean, I, I'm hoping at the end of the day, they they fall in love with 
one of the authors. And then they say, hmm, I'm going to check out their book. I'm going to follow them. I'm going to attend their speeches and stuff like that. But these distribution platforms where people are, they're good places to meet, connect, network. So that is why I believe in them. And I feel like, hey, sometimes if you're not there and you have this beautiful message to share, well, our people may be turning somebody, let's say somebody right now is looking for, like Stephanie wrote a book of mental health awareness, and that's who's, who's next here. Uh, mental health awareness in the workplace. Well, if Stephanie's, if Stephanie's not on a certain platform, well, are they finding that message of mental health awareness somewhere else when her book's a great book and her, her courses and everything like that? It's great. So Stephanie, weigh in on all this. That's a, that's a segue. Let's see. I, sometimes I have Stephanie's book around here. Here it is. Let's see. For the live streamers, let's see. Perspectives Through Broken Glass, A Guide to Navigating Depression at Home and in the Workplace. Yeah, look at that. Look at that plug. Stephanie, what do you got going on? Go on. Hey, guys. So I'm really glad that Medieval went right before me because I couldn't agree more. I think the social media platforms we have were initially started to be a place of natural connection, right? Of you know, networking with people that we already knew and just keeping up with them. And I think it, it changed. And um, to, to the point, Dominic, that you mentioned earlier about ADD, like I openly have ADHD, recently diagnosed. So I wrote notes as we were starting the conversation. Um, but I just, I wanted to call out from a views perspective. I don't, um, I don't care about views. In fact, what I've noticed is, is that if I have a video that gets like zero, one, 10, 50 views when I'm normally getting more. If I repost it at a different time of day or repost it with different, um, after I've posted other things like it, it will get more views. So I, I'm not concerned with views. In fact, I'm like, oh, I put content out there and that's great. And now I get to reuse my content, which means I have to do less work later, which is awesome. Um, but I honestly, I would like to move away from social media. So Dominic talked about my book and thank you for the plug. Um, and I was going to kind of go there because one of the chapters in my book is stop letting the algorithm control your life. Um, so what Prof T and what Julie said are both right. Like, the, the media giants have used psychology to dictate the algorithm. So you see the things that you interact with, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those are the things that you like or the things that you should have, right? So if you do have mental health issues, for instance, you may see a bunch of posts and like love because you can relate to those. And it's about how just like just dis, uh, depressing the world is, right? So <laughs> it's just kind of one of those things where we have to understand that psychology manipulates the algorithms, which means that we're being manipulated. And to Prof T's point, we have to dictate our communities. We have to dictate our algorithms. We have to control the input. So remove people that post negativity, remove people that don't support your purpose, remove people that that troll you, right? And then build a community like Prof T was talking about. Um, I have found more clients through one-on-one -on -one interactions. Um, personally, I really love like love Clubhouse or um, Clubhouse is great too, but Lunch Club. And um, those are one-on-one -on -one direct interactions. You sign up for one time a week and you get a one-on-one -on -one person and you don't necessarily have those huge views, but you get an interaction that's valuable, people who support your, your mission and your cause. And those are the people that I really want to work with. I'm, I'm working on building my own community as well. So, um, you know, and I just recently found an app that allows you to build a group type community similar to a Facebook group not attached to any other social media. It's just it's just a group app. And I'm working on moving people over there because I want to be able to provide that for people who don't even want to be on social media, like medieval, right? Like I want them to be able to access that stuff without having to potentially damage their mental health by going online. And I am complete. Thank you. This is Heather. Can I just say something really quick? Because Go for it. I mean, this has been my like moral conundrum my whole entire life in regards to my social media profession. Um, you know, because 
social media is so closely correlated to depression and mental health issues. Um, it is a huge thing. I mean, I have three kids. Nobody's allowed on social media <laughs> at all. Um, I use social media as a tool, but there's many other people out there that, you know, use it to connect with other people and to, uh, you know, kind of share their daily lives. And that could be detrimental to your health. And so, you know, I just, I wanted to say, like, I love this conversation and I'm so happy to hear that there's this like push to, I know it's crazy and I shouldn't say this as a social media professional, but like to get off of social media because it is detrimental to our health. It is closely correlated to those who have mental health issues and also who those who take their own lives, trigger warning. Um, and so I just, I, and you know, I was, I'm even doing research about, and I think this is may push me to do it more is, um, I was going to do a TEDx talk about the correlation between depression, especially in younger kids and the use of social media. Um, and when social media started was the rise of depression, um, you know, in younger kids, because I mean, I was the first generation to literally be on the internet, like AIM, AOL, all of that stuff. And I had unfettered freaking access. So, you know, the safety of social media has definitely gotten better, but I feel as though the mental health portion of it has not, and it's just gotten worse. So I just really like um, where everybody's going with this in regards to kind of having like stepping away from social media and kind of taking control of that narrative. So um, thanks, guys. I want to piggyback really quick. There? Hey, oh, hold, so I hold, had hold, yeah, okay, good. We, so we'll go Profty, right. then Stephanie, and Tom, did, hold on here. Hold on, let me get some order. We need order. Okay, we'll go Profty, Tom, then Stephanie. How's that? Sounds good, bud. Thank you. Um, so, Heather, you're absolutely right. And Stephanie, I just back channeled you. I just followed you. Um, let's connect. You know, I just did an article on LinkedIn the other day on this topic. And I've been studying this, teaching this, and researching this for several years. And you're absolutely right. The mental health is extremely correlated with cell phone use, especially in young people. And I was actually on um, I was actually on the news for like 10 minutes one time a couple of years ago on a couple of tips to help your child get through trauma. It was right when COVID had hit. And you know what? with with the trauma of covid the whole world's been traumatized and we are on overload but with the rise in all the apps there is now <laughs> listen you guys there is now a diagnosable code of cell phone addiction who knew so i did write this and there are ways to go about it but the funny thing is you guys here we sit on our phone on an app and all of us all of us are on something every single day. So I don't know where the limit is. I can only tell you from my own personal perspective. I teach college students. Their attention span is extremely short. They have their phones, um, the whole class all day, and you're not allowed to take it from them. You're not allowed to even, you're not allowed to admonish them. And so it starts at home. But as parents, we have to teach and we have to be the example. And yes, uh, there have been significant anxiety disorders that are strictly correlated to cell phone use um, and over usage of device, the blue light syndrome, all of those mm -hmm. things. And there are many kids being, and I'm going to step into the deep water here, many kids being um, diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, and other things on the spectrum. And it stands to reason that it could simply be from lack of exercise, overstimulation of devices, and the inability to settle down. Thank you. That's all I'm going to say. Prof T, over to you, Tom. Thanks, Prof T. So a um, couple of things here. Uh, <laughs> so I want to, uh, Prof T, I want to push back on one thing you just said real quick, because it's like a, it's a, it's a little I bit of a pet peeve. I <laughs> All right, cool. So it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, but I have conversations with people all the time where they talk about how nobody's got attention spans anymore. Right. And, and there's a little bit of an issue with that attention spans, our ability to pay attention to things, right. Which is what generally we're referring to when we talk about attention spans, our ability to pay attention to things, what grabs our attention, things like that are actually traits that are, are coded in evolution, right? There are evolutionary traits 
things that attract our attention uh, through vision, through hearing, things like that, uh, are are broadly speaking behaviors that are are genetically coded, are instinctual, right? Um, and and are developed over evolution. And evolution doesn't happen in one generation or two generations, at least not in a measurable sense. The change is so incremental that it takes multi, many, many generations of change over time before you can really see a difference. And so I push back on the on the attention span thing. My And, and I'm not saying that they're not uh, having difficulty paying attention or they're not paying rapt attention. My argument is that they're not, they don't have shorter attention spans. They're just more distracted right? We just have a lot more stuff coming at us than we did historically, right? So there's more, we're more inundated with information and data, right? Uh, than we were in the past. I would, I would argue though, that if, uh, that I, if you rewind the clock and you go back 50 years and you talk to somebody who taught college students, they would say something very similar to you, but they would talk about how they, the kids were staring out of the window or they weren't paying attention because they were talking to each other or they were passing notes or something like that. Um, so I, I would, I would say that it's not so much, it's not attention span. I would actually take that stand. I would say it's not attention span. It's the amount of stuff that we have coming at us. The other thing that I wanted to say, which is like broadly uh, targeted at, this conversation is, um, I kind of, it makes me think of when we were talking to Heather before, uh, about, uh, this undesirable client of hers, um, and Dr. Tachi, uh, you know, said that you were said to Heather that she thought, um, Heather was giving her too much power, giving this client too much power. And I think, we're kind of doing the same thing with social media here. You don't, nobody has to be on social media. Is it a good idea to have a presence on social media? Absolutely, right? From a business perspective, is it a good idea to have a presence? Definitely. Um, but do you have to? No. There are plenty of people that operate in this world with no presence on social media and run businesses and are successful and happy, et cetera. So it's not a requirement. The fact that we feel like it's, an, it's a requirement is more of a commentary on us and the way we're internalizing external social pressures, I think, than it is on what social media is. I don't think there's anything inherently evil about social media. I think the sort of uh, uh, the place where you get into a bad space is where social media organizations have intentionally ignored correlations like you were talking about, Dr. Uh, Prof T. Um, they've intentionally ignored uh, known correlations between uh, rates of teen depression and rates of teen suicide um, and use of their apps, right? So that's where I think that sort of the that that practiced ignorance uh, that they've exercised. I think that's the sort of evil thing. the 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 app in and of itself is just an app. There is nothing sort of good or evil to it. It's just computer programming, right? And at the end of the day. All the algorithms are designed to do the exact same thing. And I, I like I say this over and over again. I said it in a conversation I had yesterday with somebody and I'll, I'll say it again. I know I've said it in this room before, um, but every single algorithm on every single social media app is all they're all designed to do the exact same thing. They do it different ways, but they're all designed to do the same thing. Is that, and that thing is to keep you on the app for as long as possible. Because in social media, on social media apps, our attention, our time is the commodity, right? That's what they are selling to advertisers. Or our behavioral data is what they're selling to advertisers. And so our time on the app, right, is how they make money. And so every algorithm is designed to keep us on the app and interacting with the app for as long as possible. And it's it, that's it. It's that simple. Like that's what they're all designed to do. They're all designed to do it different ways, but that's what they're all designed to do. And so just bear that in mind as you use these different platforms that your time and your attention is the commodity. And at the end of the day, you control your behavior, right? You control your behavior. You can't control what the app does. You can't control what the people who run the apps do, right? You can't control any of those things, but you control your behavior. Right. So you make the choice that's best for you and don't worry about what anybody else is doing or you have to be on social media or you have to do this. You have to do that. You don't have to do anything. Right. 
be careful in the choices and be deliberate in the choices you make because what you do is what you choose to do, not so, what someone else is making you do, right? Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to hit that. I know that was a lot. I just kind of like, I feel like I unloaded with both barrels. Um, but I want to, uh, I want to go back to, uh, back down to Stephanie and, uh, and see if that maybe helped with your thinking or, or, you know, these, these other perspectives helped with, uh, uh, your thinking on that initial question. Yeah. I think that you summed up everything really nicely. You're, you're absolutely right. And that's kind of, that's the thing, right? So it's about whether or not you are taking control of these pieces, right? And whether or not you're creating it. So I couldn't agree more. Um, what I wanted to say earlier, Heather, is I just wanted to circle back to, you know, you made a comment about, I have this moral dilemma. You know, I want to be on there to help people, but I understand that there are side effects and risks and things like that. And I just want to say to you that, like, don't feel guilty, right? Because you have a mission. Your mission is to help people. And we were all there to do something. And there's somebody out there that doesn't understand this stuff, right? So we're talking about the algorithm. We're talking about taking control. It's because the majority of us who are here understand that that's how those systems work. Most people who are using those apps don't understand that. And so we have the power to shift the perspective for people to help them to understand that and take back control over this situation, right? It's, it's, we've been talking about this for many, many years, right? Boycotts and people have power in manipulating organizations to do what we need them to do as a community. And so the more that we talk about this, the more we have open conversations, hopefully the more that it will change and, and, you know, those algorithms will stop being manipulated in that way. Right. And, you know, again, like you said, uh, Tom, it's about us taking control and understanding what we need, but until everybody gets on the same page with that, um, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be us out there making the difference and, and helping people to understand and shifting that perspective. So I'm done. Hey, thank you. This is good stuff. I want not the smartest guys in the room. I, 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 I pinged Johnny real quick before because hey, I don't know how much time he has, but Johnny, I was in a room last night and you got up on the, you were on the stage and you spoke. <laughs> and hey. it, okay. What, what do I got here? Yeah, go on. Hold on. Don't, all right. Hold on. Let me clear my head. See, that's how sidetracked I get. So I'm in this room last night. Johnny's talking in the subject of, um, what is it? It's when you're, um, oh, Johnny, you're imposter syndrome. That's it, Johnny. You, and you nailed imposter syndrome and look at me. I lost the word. He nailed imposter syndrome and this, and I'm sure we all feel it at some point. Like, Oh, this person's here. This person's there. I got this message. They sold this many books. This, blah, 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 blah. And so Johnny, I thought you nailed it. And as soon as I heard it, you, it was in my mind. And would you mind sharing that with us? And then we'll just keep rolling. Around. Well, yeah, so I, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is John Pica. You can call me Johnny. And uh, I'm a multidiscipline entertainer and storyteller. For the last 40 years, I've been working professionally as an entertainer and storyteller, and, uh, author, podcaster. Um, but uh, yeah, so we were talking about imposter syndrome. And for those of you who don't know, imposter syndrome is this, this, phenomenon where you get into your own head and you, you basically you question your worthiness to be where you are, whatever level you're at or whatever room you're in, stage you're speaking on, what you question your success. And there's always this voice in the back of your head that says, you know, these people are going to discover I'm a fraud. I don't belong here. Um, you know, not, nothing. I'm not worth anything that I have. That's imposter syndrome. And the fact of the matter is anyone who's in the creative arts, in the creative industries, suffers from imposter syndrome. And I'm going to say anyone who's in any field where there is a competitive nature feels imposter syndrome. And a dear friend of mine once told me that 
the only people who have imposter syndrome are the people who are actually doing something worth doing. They're the people who are doing the work, who are actually accomplishing something worthwhile, and those are the people who suffer from imposter syndrome. And that's always, you know, resonated with me because I, I swing throughout the day. I, I have these swings where I'm like, I'm the best in the world. I don't deserve to be here. I'm the best in the world. Nothing is good. And, and that's that's me all day long. Um, and the key for me has been to remember to celebrate your wins and your victories. Don't dwell on what you lack or don't have. And, and here was the example I gave yesterday. Um, we, uh, we are, my podcast, Back of the Cereal Box, two days ago, hit the top 200 on Apple Podcasts in our category. We Number 126. Out of the hundreds of thousands of podcasts, we are now ranked at 126. And that was huge. And along with that, we've got some brand sponsorships that are coming to us and paying us to promote their product. They're coming to me now. I'm not going to them, they're coming to me. But I let it get all over me that a specific brand that we've been pursuing that is a perfect fit for our audience, for our demographic, for our topic, has completely ghosted me. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't focus on the wins. I focused on this one sponsor that won't respond to emails or phone calls and completely ignored all of the amazing stuff that is happening. And when you do that, that imposter syndrome takes over and it can really affect you adversely. So my, my advice to everybody last night was celebrate your wins, celebrate the smallest wins. If it's 20 new listeners today, celebrate that with a post on social media, with a, an email newsletter, uh, e-blast, whatever it is, however you celebrate, make sure you acknowledge your victories, your wins, and celebrate them to avoid the crushing defeat of imposter syndrome. How's that, Dom? Thanks, Johnny, man. I, I appreciate you. And it just that, that imposter syndrome thing is something that I hear so often. I heard you talking about it yesterday. I think, I think I'm guilty of it. I think probably a lot of people are guilty of it or victim of it, whatever you want to call it. But just Johnny turning it around and saying, maybe it wasn't a bad thing. But Johnny, you did sound like you were on a rocket to the moon. So is there something else that you want to tell us? But you did sound good and bring it home. But Message good, but you did sound like you were on a rocket to the moon. You up in space? Um, I'm in the car driving. When, usually when I'm on Clubhouse, I am in the car. Um, because, you know, kind of dovetailing into the previous discussion before you even prompted me. Um, when I'm in my office or if I'm on stage or if I'm involved in the, another project, the phone gets turned off and put away. So I'm not on Clubhouse or social media um, a whole lot throughout the work day. Um, I do have some team members that post to social media on my behalf. And I do have some scheduled time blocks throughout the day to do some social media marketing and promotion. But otherwise, um, I'm, I'm not engaged during those time blocks. And I turn the phone off and I put it away so that I'm not distracted, so that I can focus on what I need to do, either working with clients or working on a new creative project or whatever it is. So long story short, the only time I'm on, I'm on Clubhouse is when I'm driving. Right on, brother. And we appreciate you for it. Keep on driving. Go on, Tom. 
Uh, I was just going to say, so like uh, when I here's what pops into my head when I hear imposter syndrome and maybe I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, but if you remember, it was in uh, it was part of the Wayne's World skit from Saturday Night Live, but they did it in the movies, too, um, where Wayne and Garth would do the I'm not worthy thing and like get down on their knees and bow down. Right. I, I don't know if anybody else in the room like you know, throw a clap up or something. If you remember that, if you can like hear it in the back of your head, hear them going, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. Right. So like, that's what I think of. That's like how I analogize, um, imposter syndrome is I think like in the back of my mind, like that's the voice that I hear. Right. When like somebody hits me with praise or like congratulates me on something, you, you hear that voice in the back of your mind going, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. And, you know, I think uh, to Johnny's point, you know, if someone decides to give us praise, if someone decides to laud our accomplishments, if someone else decides to congratulate us on something, then we are worthy because they decided we were worthy, right? It's not up to us to decide whether or not we're worthy to accept their praise. Like they're the ones giving it, right? So accept it graciously is like the sort of the lesson that I was taught. Um, more as an adult than as a kid, humbly and graciously accept the praise. But then the other thing too, when Johnny talks about like, um, you know, celebrating your wins, a great framework to do that. If you struggle, you know, with this, we're not worthy voice in the back of your mind, a great way to celebrate your wins is to do it through the frame of gratitude. So rather than posting on social media and feeling like when you look at those posts that it it comes across like bragging or that you're patting yourself on the back. Talk about how grateful you are for all the people that listen to your podcast or all the people that have joined your community or all the people that have uh, subscribed to your business or whatever the case may be, right? Talk about how grateful you are for the opportunities, how, uh, how much you value the people that are part of your community. Talk about it through that frame rather than talking about uh, the accomplishment in and of itself, right? And it's a great way to sort of avoid imposter syndrome, getting in the way of you celebrating accomplishments in your life. So do it through the frame of gratitude. Uh, and that way you don't have to, uh, you don't have to feel like you're patting yourself on the back or in the back, like, or what I hear in my mind is my mom's voice when I was a kid saying, nobody likes a braggart. Like we don't brag, don't brag. Nobody likes a braggart. Right. So like in order to not hear that voice, to not hear that repeating in the back of my head, I try to do uh, I try to share wins through the frame of gratitude. And that uh, that seems to work for me. So I hope it helps uh, somebody else. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we're going to go to Julie, Julie Rock. I love gratitude, man. When people like Tom saying there's just something about people that let you know how thankful they are. I'll tell you. I'm a Kenny Chesney fan. I got into country music uh, about ten years, about fifteen years ago. In my restaurant, I couldn't get any channels because there was the exhaust systems and everything like that. And I got into country music, and I've loved it ever since. And um, went to a Kenny Chesney concert, and this guy thanks before every song. The reason I wrote this song is I had a dear friend. Thank you very much at this concert. Thank you, hardworking people, for giving your time today and being here. And he does it so often in every song, over and over and over. I'm raising my hands like, yeah, thank you, love this guy. I can't get enough of him just talking and thanking everybody for where he is at that moment. I'm just it's so endearing. So. Get out there and uh, share that gratitude, like Tom says. Uh, and be sincere. And I think he's being sincere. Okay, Julie Rock, what do you got going on today? How you been? Always good to see you. You always inspire us as well. There's a lot of topics. I can't even handle them all. So uh, you, have to, you have to step up and root through them and take us where you want to go. I don't even know where we're going. All I'm thinking about is I'm grateful for the journey. I was just thinking about that. I, I had a conversation, a networking call just a few minutes ago with somebody that I used to work with. And she's like, Julie, I'm so proud of you. You've done so much and you're, you're, you're doing it. You're really doing it. And, you know, I started my business over a year ago and I'm like thinking to myself, no, I really have. What have I done? I'm thinking to myself, oh, thank you so much. But in my head, I'm thinking, 
well, what have I really accomplished? You know, but, but after listening to what everybody's saying, it's like, well, I just have to be thankful for the journey. And then yesterday I talked to my one friend and she's like, Julie, it takes five years to build a successful coaching business. And I'm like, okay, five years I'm, I'm on the journey. And I guess my thought right now is that I'm grateful for the journey and you know, that's success in and of itself because not everybody's going on that journey. Not everybody has the courage to go on the journey and it's hard. It's a grind. You know, I'm, I'm working a lot. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm making it happen, but at the same time, it feels slow. So thanks for letting me share that and vent a little bit, but I appreciate everyone here and I appreciate the space. Thank you. Jolie, thank you. You you remind me of a post that I saw yesterday. It was, it was uh, Gary V. I'm I'm a big Gary V. fan. I like the honesty, like like the vibe and stuff. And he was talking about when he started off, and he's doing his wine library. And I don't know if you he worked for his dad's wine company and basically took that business online. And he's doing videos. He's doing YouTube early, and he said. Early on, he got so much heat, heat from his friends. Hey, you know, he'd go somewhere and he could hear people whispering. And it was even like the people that he knew whispering. And then at the same time, he said he got some praise. And he says, now looking back, hate, praise, it was exactly the same thing. Because he was just on the journey, like Julie. He was just on the journey. The hate was part of it. The praise was part of it. But he knew where he was going. So, uh, my just how I wanted to wrap that up and is uh, just stay the course, man. There's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. There's going to be shitty days, days where you want to quit, days where you think you should have quit. And then days all of a sudden where you get two new clients or three people pay you at the same time. And you're like, holy cow, I'm rich. Or this, this is this is working exactly how I thought it was supposed to work. Or all of a sudden you're at the mall and somebody comes up to you and they said, I watched back of the cereal box today or I read uh, 14th and 2nd, or I love media casters, or Cannabis Mom, or Heather's, the restaurant says, wow, these posts were amazing. I want to go eat those uh, burgers because of it. So all that happens. Uh, stay the course. Tom, and now I I got nothing left. This is how I work. I go hard, and then I burn out. <laughs> I give it my best, and this is all I got. So um, Tom, you want to put a Tie, put a bow on all these subjects that we have talked about today because you're better at that than me. And I lean on you as always for that. Well, I don't know if I can put a bow on everything we've talked about today because we have uh, we've we've gone on a bit of a journey. We've been kind of all over the map a little bit, which is good. I, you know, again, I, I don't know how many times I've said this now, but it's one of my favorite things about this room and about um, this thing that we do every Wednesday morning, whatever we want to call it, this show, this room, whatever. Um, cause this is eventually, I swear, eventually this is going to become a podcast. I promise. Um, but this thing, uh, that not the smartest guys in the room is, uh, but, but yeah, one of my favorite things about it is that it is, it is unpredictable in the best possible way. And that we allow the conversation to evolve. We allow the conversation to go where it needs to go rather than sort of being too heavy handed and dictating what we can talk about and what we can't talk about and how we can talk about it and and all of those things um, that kind of tend to drive me nuts about Clubhouse and spaces like this where um, you get folks up on stage who are who are uh, uh, really there for themselves and uh, really opening the room um for them and not so much for the audience and not so much for the people participating. And so they are very heavy handed with how they steer the conversation and uh, we try not to be. So um, uh, yeah, I, all that to say a very long winded way of saying there's no way I could possibly sum up everything we've talked about. Um, but I will, I will just tack on one thing to what you said about staying the course, Dom. And this is something that this is a realization I kind of had to come to myself Um I've, I spent the first 17 years, uh, ish of my career, um, in the entertainment industry, working for other people. I was freelance most of that time, but still was working for other people. Um, and I really only became an entrepreneur about four years ago. And in the course of becoming an entrepreneur in the last four years, um, I've realized that no one 
has everything all figured out. No one starts their business knowing all the answers. No one uh, takes the next step in their business knowing exactly what the outcomes are going to be and how things are going to shake out in five or 10 years. In fact, most people, if you ask them what their five-year plan is and then check in with them five years later, it's going to look dramatically different from what they described to you, right? So all of that to say, I've spent four years, I finally come up with a mission for my business, right? Like it's taken me that long to really kind of like hone in on things. So business, entrepreneurship, life is a long game, right? There, there is no, there is no hack. There is no shortcut. You just have to stay the course. You have to put in the work and you have to be patient. You have to give things an opportunity to succeed or fail, right? And I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned and one of the things I wanted to tack on to what you were saying, Dom, about staying the course is you have to give everything you do the opportunity to succeed or fail and then make decisions based on on which direction things go. But but you can't force it, right? So you just have to be patient and uh, and and put in the time, put in the work. Right. So, uh, so that's it. That's all I got for today. Now I'm going to say that I'm all tapped out and, uh, want to end this just by saying thank you to everybody for being here. We really appreciate all of you. We do our best, um, to let you guys know that, uh, at the beginning of the show, at the end of the show, by bringing everybody up on stage, by giving everybody, uh, a forum in which to ask questions and share tips. Um, and, uh, we hope to see you guys here again next Wednesday with not the smartest guys in the room, AKA Dom and myself, Tom. We'll see you guys then. Thanks so much for being here. I love you guys.